I'm not sure if I am overreacting by feeling like he should be the one to find a new job and not settle for something that I would also have to work. But then I feel bad for making him assume all the responsibility financially. This is the struggle of man. Every Sunday night, families would get together and talk about their week. You know, your cousin Billy is having a hard time financially. The family would get together and buy groceries or take the kids an extra night a week to make sure that everybody's taken care of. As the family dynamic has gotten smaller and smaller and the homes have gotten bigger and bigger, we don't have that connection. And the more unhappy we are, the more likely we are to spend our money to get a dopamine response to fill that void. I will bear the weight of the world as long as I fucking can. But when you see that I can't do it anymore, that little bit of fucking help goes a long way. Sometimes that help is like, babe, I love you and thank you for the life that you've given me. And we are back. We are back, Bumblebees. Episode 51. We are one episode away from a year. We are one episode away from a year. We are one episode away from wrapping up 2023. That's that gave crazy. me goosebumps. It's crazy, right? That, so, yeah. yeah. Season one is over. It's done. Mm-hmm. On to season two. So we just got back from vacation. It's still November. By the time you guys see this, it'll be mid-December because episode 52 goes live on Christmas Day. And I think we should do a long episode for that. Like We're, how long? I, I don't know. Three hours. Because we haven't done a three-hour episode in a while. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. We should bust out some onesies. Um, we're also not going to have the kids Christmas Eve. Okay. So if you want to do like a live stream or something for Christmas Eve for the people who are, who are going to be alone. We could do that. We could do that. We could do that. Uh, so we're going to have to bust out the onesies. We, we, we I've already ordered some that are going to be unique. And every year I think we should get a new mm-hmm. one-year Christmas onesie. Um, I, I am excited to see how all of this is going to play out ramping into 2024. We have a whole lot of, um, things currently happening. Let me back up. We just got back from vacation. I'm, I'm in, I'm in work mode. Yeah. Brain is going hard. Uh, do you want to talk about vacation? We can. How was vacation for you? It was good for me. I very much enjoyed being out. I hate Florida. Yeah. <laughs> Same. I hate it so much. The whole time that we were packing up to leave, the kids were like, we don't want to go home. And I was like, I don't want to go home. And you were like, I don't want to go home. (laughs) It it was dope to be able to wake up and it's not 100 degrees outside and the sun was not already killing us. There were animals outside. Lots of deer. There was family. Lots of family. I think that was the biggest thing for me. More more than the animals, more than the weather. Although I, I loved... Oh my God, did I love the weather. Uh, Loved riding in the mountains. All of that was super fun. But for me, it was the family. It was the fact that like I got to experience that again. Like that's not something we get very often. That Thanksgiving was fun. You know, I was, me and your sister were cooking. The kids were running around outside. We were all taking turns riding the dirt bikes around the yard. I heard you laughing. That was nice. There was lots of laughter. Yeah. It was very cool to see. So uh, my sister homeschools and all three of her kids are really, for the most part, decent kids. Mm -hmm. They share well. Like there was not a whole lot of bickering. Um, My my adopted brother's son was there and he's also like extended family to us. Mm -hmm. And they just shared. There was no like, it's my turn. I want to ride. Like they did a couple laps and he jumped off and gave it to, to Micah and Micah jumped off and gave it to somebody else. And then I jumped on and gave the little ones rides and like, I was, jumped on. You did and learned to stand and ride at the same yeah, time. I did that. Yeah. Talk about your near death experience. We can. <laughs> <laughs> so we get there Wednesday night, Thursday, Thanksgiving. We spend the whole day with the family. And then Friday morning you hit me with, we're going to go riding. And I was like, okay, We drop the kids off. We get to the first place three minutes into the trail. I'm like, I'm not doing this. Yeah. There was, it was already two. This is, so it's been almost two decades since I've been on an actual bike, pedaling a bike. Right. And us being in Tennessee is my fifth time riding my dirt bike in the woods. And I was like, I'm not going over ruts. I cannot go vertically up a hill. Like that's not happening. (laughs) And then we go to a second place and we, I went up almost vertically. (laughs) You did really good though. It was paved. 
Yeah, it was paved. It was horribly paved. A lot of foliage, so there was no grip on anything. We get up to the top, and it's just the tower. <laughs> it was such a pointless ride up. <laughs> and then on the way back down, I'm not even hitting the throttle. It was all brakes. And like I feel my shit like sliding from behind me, and I'm like I'm doing the thing, and I felt super cool. And we got down to the bottom, and I was like, oh, curb. And I went up over the curb, and I was like, you bad bitch. <laughs> they even fall off of it. And then we get onto the trail. <laughs> And you're in front, I'm in the middle, and Joe's behind me. And we're on the trail, and I'm doing decent. Like, I'm going over bumps and rocks, and I'm doing okay. And then there's this massive fucking tree that fell into the into the path, and you just rode over it. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm just riding over it. And I did. And the whole, only thing that made contact on my bike when I went over that tree was my hands. Uh, like, that uh, bucked me. Right over, yeah. Yeah. And I, I went over the tree. I landed on the other side. And I looked at you and I was like, holy shit, I didn't die. <laughs> and you're like, but you did it. And I was like, I did it. So now I can, I'm almost certain I can go over any tree ever now. <laughs> <laughs> Love that confidence. Um, there was a little mud patch that I had to put my foot on while simultaneously riding at the same time, which I've never done before. My body did not compute how to do that. Joe had to hold on to my handlebars as I went through the mud and like he walked me through it. And then we're zooming and we're going and then something happens and I'm suddenly I'm terrified, like fight or flight. We're, we're in the mountains. There's heights. My body is shaking. I can feel myself moving the bike because I'm so scared. And you were like, do you want to turn around? And I was like, no. <laughs> you couldn't tell through my sobs, but in my brain, I was like, I ain't no bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, no, I just need to calm myself down and we need we can keep going and like 10 seconds later, my we go, I go over something and the back of my bike kicks out from behind me and I slide down the side of the mountain a little bit. Ye like my bike lands on top of me. Yeah. It, it's a mess. And I'm just full breaking down. Like I really thought I was going to die sliding off that mountain with my bike on top of me. Yeah, there was there was definitely fear in your voice. And yeah. there's a whole lot of shaking. I watched the video or the footage of you riding back and you can tell you were shaking. I was scared. The entire ride back. Yeah. I realized that I, I think I know that you struggle with sugar sand and ruts. Right. Most novice riders will struggle with that. Sugar sand sucks. Mm -hmm. Ruts are hard because if your tire doesn't hit it right, it'll jerk you. Right. So that's normal. Even experienced riders don't enjoy hitting ruts like that sucks. But you add somebody's fear of heights. Also, I learned last night that men's number one fear is heights. Really? Yeah, because somebody tried telling telling me on a TikTok that it was uh, rejection. Yeah. It's not. I Googled it. It's fear of heights. Men's number one fear across the board is heights, which mm -hmm. is fucking weird to me. Because it's not being high you have to worry about. It's the sudden stop if you fall. Right. Uh, so falling should be the number one fear, right? Mm -hmm. Anyways, so uh, I think that your fear of heights added on to your uneasiness on the bike yeah i've never ridden over roots yeah. and rocks and i think i have not been it. on a trail that big before and single track is so fun i found some moderate florida trails florida trails are easy because it, it's just sand as long right. as we're not in sugar sand you'll be fine however i did buy you new tires so you'll have a giant five inch back tire so if you do hit sugar sand you should have a whole lot of <laughs> traction to go yeah um i am so hooked on trail riding right now like it's so stupid mm -hmm. i am having so much fun riding around joe fell twice yeah uh i laid your bike down but it was like the rock and i went Eep. <laughs> and i was like oh i laid her bike down and i stood right back up yeah uh, there was one part where he fell that my i like almost ran him over because i was coming up hot behind him mm -hmm. And his tire went in a hole and he went over the handlebars and I stopped. And when I went to stop, like the bike tipped and where my foot went was a hole, which is the hole he hit. Yeah. And it was like three foot deeper. So my entire body shifted off the bike and I had to push the bike over. Mm -hmm. And I was holding on to your seat with my leg because I was riding your bike at the time. Yeah. And I was like, like ninja kicking <laughs> but this way, trying to hold myself up from falling. That, yeah. It was a shit show. It was a lot of fun. That video just finished editing for the life account or uh, posting to the life account. I sent it to Jordan today. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Jordan, Jordan, I hope you get well. Uh, Jordan bought a Suron also and was practicing willies last night, night before and fell, broke his ankle and had to have surgery yesterday. That poor man. Yeah. So the bike fell on him. I don't know if it was just like a fluke, weird bend fall, but right. you know, these things are going to happen when you're doing 
shit on bicycles or dirt bikes. So I want to learn to jump my bike. Yeah. Yeah. I want to do all of it. I want to stunt it so we're on like riding around on the streets and shit. I can like twelve o'clock wheelie it. And yeah. Whatnot. I want to get those pegs on the back wheels. Oh, you you're gonna go hard, huh? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm I'm working the wheelie thing now. I, I'm so afraid of falling on concrete. Yeah. Because road rash sucks. Broken it does. bones are okay. Like I've broken a lot of bones. I'm fine with that. But road rash. Mm -mm. When I had my motorcycle accident, that hurt worse than breaking my femur. Yeah. Oh, I mean, my tailbone was the worst pain of all of it because you can't sit or lay down or stand. It just hurts all the time and there's nothing they can do about it. So you're just in pain. Um, but road rash sucks, especially if it's massive and you have to scrub rocks out of it and things like that. It's not fun. I, I'm glad that you experienced that little bit of riding and didn't die. Me too. <laughs> we got back and I laid in the van. And I was like, now that my body is not panicking about death, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That's that's where the fun comes for us too. Yeah. Is that it is a thrill and it is dangerous and you are doing it in stupid shit at high speeds and like, it, it it's good. I I want to, my goal for twenty twenty four is to work less. I want to continue the content that we're putting out, but I want to structure our lives so that we have five to six hours, two to three times a week to just do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can make that work based off of the people that we now employ, um. It, it should pan out that way. Right. Um, we've cut back on the live streams, so Wednesdays no longer gets lives, um, which I think is going to create more of a demand for us. It may drop our revenue on Facebook a little bit, but it frees up a day, and that mm -hmm. is more important. Um, but I think the more we ride, because we got your Supermoto tires on your Teleria now, and we have your dirt tires ordered for your Suron, because we both have a street and dirt bike, the more you're on your street bike, because if you fall, you're going low speeds unless you're fucking flying down the road. Right. You can practice doing circles at low speed so you can get used to that like low speed wobble and work on your balance and things like that. It's no different than a bicycle. The more time you're on it, the more comfortable you are with the bike. I think you'll be a badass. I think that you just got to get over. Well, the fear of heights will probably always be a thing. But I mean, I mean, it wasn't that bad. I got out there. Yeah. Like I did it. I had a couple scares. I had I had one that like. Yeah. I, I started to go down and started to go the wrong way. And when I put my foot down, there was nothing there. And like my foot did like that. And it was all rocks. And had I fallen, it would have been like rock, 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 rock all the way down the mountain. Cause it was not, not good. Yeah. But I didn't, but did you die? No. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take credit for that because I prayed after you left. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The power of prayer of your wife's prayer. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I was like, even if he gets injured, just bring him back. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Even if, if he slides off the mountain and we lose a bike and he has a broken bone, I'd rather him be alive. Yeah, you yeah. well, could always buy another bike. Ain't worried about that. Yeah, I actually think that I'm going to try to find a used one for Micah. He really had fun on that bike. He did. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of things that I would like to do, mm -hmm. and I'm taking the steps to make that happen, but I, I think that we really need to start like legitimate planning a move um remind me to talk to you about that after we're done with this okay because there's things that that i talked to sean about yesterday that i don't want to get into on the podcast that are relevant to all of that so okay i came home last night yesterday and we did all the life stuff you got got the house back in order and got everything put kind away of. kind of yeah it, it's way more than what it was when we walked in the door yeah um kids had a great time their playground was up they got to play and i went right back to work and started correcting things that I'm having problems with with the podcast and trying to smooth things over in that area. Mm -hmm. But last night at about 4.30, I clocked off and started looking for our next vacation. Yes. <laughs> so I, I think that we're probably going to go back to the Blue Ridge or, or Smoky Mountain area okay. um, after Christmas, maybe for a week, go to Wednesday to Wednesday kind of thing and just do New Year's up there or something. I don't, I don't know. But I am ready to, I want to start doing that on a consistent basis just to get away and decompress. Mm hmm um, I noticed that you did a whole lot better mentally without social media up your ass the entire time. Yeah, I did. It was really nice. Yeah. I d daily, I spent less than 45 minutes accumulatively on my phone. Yeah. Yeah. I was on mine a whole lot more. Yeah. But that was because I was using all trails to travel. I was still trying to maintain TikTok, still checking in on the Discord, still checking in with our employees and things like that. But it was not. Actually, I found myself scrolling mindlessly at the cabin. Yeah, on TikTok. Yeah, which is cool because it wasn't work related. Mm -hmm. I haven't got to just enjoy mindlessly scrolling TikTok in a long time because every time I get on there, it's yeah. to work, not just watch cat videos or dog videos. And 
I'm glad you got to enjoy it. Yeah. I started doing um, word searches before bedtime up there. I think I'm going to continue doing that. Yeah. I think I'm also going to start getting up at 530 every morning. Why is that? Because I don't, I want to read my Bible daily. And when I think about reading my Bible, the kids are up my ass where I have to cook dinner or laundry has to be done. And 530 in the morning, there's nothing going on. It gives you extra time. Yeah, that, that morning time was always so big to me. Yep. For a long time, that, that hour to hour and a half before nobody else woke up in the house in my life. And like, there was probably a decade of that. And that was just, that was my me time. I would get up and, and research stuff or, or listen to something, read something, do something that was just me. It was nice. And then I would get that little bit of gym time at the time. I was also training by myself. So that was cool too. But, um, um I took the kids to the Titanic museum. Yeah. That was dope. You know, talk about that. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> Ooh, feisty woman. I mean, do you want to hear about it? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So we got there an hour early, which I was shocked by. And I was like, hey, can we get in an hour early? And the lady was kind of like, how many are there? And I was like, well, there's six of us. And she was kind of shitty about it. But we got in anyway. I appreciate her. And <laughs> they told us no photos on the first floor. Once you go up the grand staircase, you can start taking pictures. And we were like, okay, word. And we are still outside at this point, and they have a massive photo of the Titanic, and we lined all the kids up. And we were like, say cheese, and like, look at me, and stop making that face, and we're taking multiple pictures. And this woman comes up to us, and she's like, you can't take photos here. I was like, what? And she was like, policy, you can't take photos in front of copyrighted photos. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, you can't take a picture in front of that Titanic photo. I was like... I, I said, okay, thank you, but I thought this is the fucking Titanic Museum. Right. What am I going to do? Sell photos of my children on the internet in front of the Titanic boat? What? <laughs> this is going to go into my phone archive. I'm not going to look at it for another five years. And then when they're teenagers, I'm going to be like, oh, do you remember this day? No, probably not because you were four. Did you email it to them? Yeah, I emailed them a lot of photos. Um, they had actual artifacts in there. That was pretty dope. They had a lawn chair in there. They had like little baby boots across that made it off the Titanic. They had... um. Like pieces of the grand staircase, like broken pieces they had in there. There was a gentleman who found a piece of driftwood floating from that Titanic and he whittled it into a cross. And that's on display there. It was pretty neat. The kids enjoyed it. They had like replicated hallways. There was a dude in there named Josh who worked at the museum sitting at the grand piano. And our son walked up to the piano and he's like, I want to touch it. And I was like, no. You see that big sign that says, do not touch. And then Josh points out and he was like, but it says the bow or violin. He was like, you can touch the piano, bro. So our son touched the piano. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> it was. That's cool. And I was like, thank you. And our son was like, can you play the piano? And he was like, no, I have it closed right now. And our son was like, okay. And we were walking around because I had massive photos of the crew that passed away on the ship and like remembering them. And then all of a sudden this man starts playing the piano. I was like, oh, word. And I walked over and he's blind playing the piano and our son's standing there just watching him, like just enamored with this demand playing the piano. And then he started singing. <laughs> and I could tell I must have made an expression on my face because I, I was shocked the man was playing the piano blind. And he's singing like, good for you, bro. And I guess my, I made a face because the lady across from me looked up at me and looked at me. And I was like, he's good. <laughs> I'm, I was like. But we stood there. The children wanted to hear the whole song. They didn't want to walk away. And I was like, I was kind of, I was like, kind of like a proud moment because this man is showcasing his talent that right. he has worked on for years, and they're actually appreciating it. That was a really dope mom moment. I cried. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really fun to see all of the kids come out of their shells. Like our son was doing parkour, climbing on shit, and jumping off, and he didn't say I was scared about anything. Yeah. It's good. He did all of it. Like there was a, they had like different levels of degrees of what the, tick, the what the ship looked like as it was sinking. And he was just, he was getting it, climbing it, trying to get inside of the funnel thing. And it was like, no, you can't climb on that. And he was like, but I want to. <laughs> no fear in that child. It was pretty dope. Yeah, that's exciting. I think being around the boys was good for him. Yeah. He needs that rough housing and that wrestling. I agree. I agree. I agree. I uh, we also learned that that little man likes techno. Yes, he does. I, I think something with the repetitive beats. We learned that because of Baby Shark, mm -hmm. because it's just the repetitive thing over and over and over again. And he said the same three over and over and over and over again for like yeah. an hour. And then we put on some techno, and and he was vibing with it. Like he was, he was in it. yeah, yeah, having fun, which is is kind of cool. 
you know, I, I like that he likes EDM because I, I like that kind of music. Mm-hmm. But um, That was a pretty dope moment that morning. Yeah. Our daughter was still sleeping and we were up with our son. And we just started playing music and I was being stupid and dancing and singing and shit. And you guys were laughing. Yeah, that was a good morning. Yeah. Vacations are necessary, guys. You can't work yourself to death, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I am a big proponent of, of suffer now so you don't have to do it later. But at some point you have to dis- disengage and like reset. Yep. And I feel like this this vacation was more of a reset than Vegas was. I agree. Because it was, Vegas was still work. We still vlogged and met people and there was a lot of walking and like it was just, um, it was a very different vacation. This was a whole lot of downtime and not an experience. Um, I, I, I would say it was an experience. I, I spent all of my time with the kids. Like you went off and rode dirt bikes with Joe and I spent time with the kids and your sister and did the family mom thing and we drove through the mountains and went down a scenic route and got crystals and what kind of crystal did you get? You didn't tell me that one. Oh no, we went to the burger place. Oh, the burger. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was, I was pretty salty about that. <laughs> <laughs> I heard Amy talking to her phone about getting crystals. Like you're rubbing in his face, aren't you? She, she absolutely was. Like, was. Yeah. 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 And then I got the picture of the people that recognized you at crystals. And I was like, Oh, so not only did she get the yummy little mini burger, she got recognized too. And I wasn't there for any of it. So not only does she get this amazing, gross, disgusting food that I fucking love, she was recognized. So she got recognition, too. And I'm like, this sucks. Well, you know, you guys were zooming around the mountains and seeing cool waterfalls and shit. And that kind of sucked for me. So yeah. it's a... I brought you a rock. A tra- this is a really cool rock. I you like didn't it. bring me a crystal burger. <laughs> I thought about it, but I was like, I don't know when he's going to be home. We have a two-hour drive. Yeah, I'm just giving you shit. I'd have ate that cold-ass burger, though. <laughs> I thought about it. I thought about it. I was like, I even looked at it. I was like, Crystal's going to be so upset that we're getting crystals without him. I was salty. <laughs> Joe and I didn't stop at crystals. We drove by one, and I was like, I should have stopped. I should have stopped. And the I kids didn't. like crystals. Yeah. Oh, they fucked it up. I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. I should make mini sliders. You should on Hawaiian rolls. I'll have to Instacart today. D- do that. I want to tell you about a business idea that I have. Okay. You want to do it on the podcast? Yeah. Okay. Run it. Well, because you guys are our target base. And if you don't care about it, I need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, after visiting, I'm going to start calling her our sister. I changed her name in my phone to sister. Yeah. So she's now just sister. Okay. Um, she's got the whole homestead thing going on. And I'm so fucking jealous. She showed me her chicken coop. They got hens. There was a rooster out there going cockadoodle doo. I'm like, that's what you wake up to. And she was like, yeah. I'm like, I love it. You will, you won't. I love it for like a week. I love it. Roosters are dicks. They are dicks, and I love them. It's great. Three thirty in the morning, he start screaming. Ha! <sighs> like it's time for me to get up. <laughs> I'd go about my merry day. I really, I want to grow our own food. She had like planter boxes and vines of things growing and cabbage and zucchini and peas and canned eggs that are good for five years. And I love it. So what's the business idea? I want to do homemade tinctures, solves, antibiotics, that kind of thing. All of the, the natural remedies, remedies, alternatives to big pharma. And I want to make it into a business. Okay, so how much of that is going to be hands-on for you? All of it. It's not hard to do. The longest part of the process is six weeks. Like, for example, for tinctures, I have to let it sit for six weeks. And then I strain it and bottle it. So the whole process of me actually, like, making a batch, bottling it, and getting that kind of thing together is going to be, like, three or four hours. Okay. So it's not going to be massively time-consuming for me. To make solves is the same thing. I have to make... um infused oils and it sits for four to six weeks strain it bottle it label it sell it well we need to find out the legalities of that and how we have to word things because you know natural remedies it could be considered practicing medicine without a license but i i'm for that i mean if you want to dedicate two or three days a week to doing something like that at a you know a couple hours of time i just don't want to overwork ourselves again right so well, I also want to do this for our family. I want to have my home, like a home apothecary. I want to have all the herbs and the, the salves and whatnot. I want to, because I notice giving kids over-the-counter medication does absolutely nothing for them. All right. It alleviates the symptoms a little bit, but it's not getting it out of their system. And after talking to your sister and doing the vast amount of research that I've done, doing like the natural remedies 
it just, I don't know, it worked with the body better versus something chemically made in a lab. Oh, I agree. I, I believe I believe that food is medicine. Yeah. And the problem, a lot of the problems that we have is that our food is not actual food anymore. Right. So. I want to make our own cough syrup and like those boost shots that you take. I can make I that. Love those. Yeah, you'd have to have a pretty extensive garden for that, though. Because, I can order all of it. I found a website that does wholesale. Yeah. Hmm. And bulk. As in like for like herbs? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I can buy one pound of, it, it varies on how readily available it is, how hard it is to grow and whatnot. Right. A lot of the herbs are a pound for like $17. And when I'm making something, I'll be using ounces. Is that something that you would want to do with my sister? Uh, I Yeah, I would. I told her. Not if, when we move to Tennessee, I'm trying to speak that into existence. I think, I really do think it's going to happen. I, I'm, yeah. I, we'll have to talk about that off the podcast, but right. I, I am taking steps. I started it yesterday and that's mm -hmm. what I want to talk to you about. But Okay. Um, but I told her, I was like, we could even do a thing weekly where her and I get on a garden episode. We can do it like a second drop of the garden and just have it be home remedies, apothecary herbalism. And we can focus on one herb that week. And what it's good for, how we can use it as a salve or a tincture or essential oil and the benefits and when not to use it. Because there's some things like with pregnancy you don't want to take because it increases blood flow and whatnot. But Okay. It's a lot. It's I've a lot been, of process. I, I've been thinking about this a lot. Okay. Because I also don't want to overwork myself and add more stress to your plate because this is a new endeavor I want to do. Yeah. I think that we should start that if you're going to do a garden as a garden thing, it should be like a once a month thing to start yeah. and see how it goes and then commit to more recordings if you want to do that. Okay. Um, I, I definitely think the record schedules in life will change if we actually move to Tennessee. But I mean, again, that's a 2025 end of year or mm -hmm. 2026 beginning year thought. Right. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen in two years that could change all of that. But um Having her, because she's she's a wealth of knowledge with all that. She shit. is having her involved in that would be good because she could also she could help you create the ingredient lists, and then you could just do the work, and then we could kick her back something for the, the help. Well, I found books and stuff that I want to get and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I I want to get into jarring and canning our own food and shit too. Yeah, we have a pressure cooker. Yeah, it's not even been opened yet. Okay, because my other one, uh started leaking and shit like it was became a a risk yeah yeah but that's what happens when you use them over and over and over and over and over again yeah but i really want to get into homesteading yeah yeah well we can't do that here that's definitely a a land kind of thing yeah. you could start here you know we could get you some like raised garden beds and you know you could turn your back porch into a whole little thing because it's shaded right. there is sunlight that comes through there and it's enough that like it's not going to get wind bitten from wind yeah uh, for, you know, frostbitten or whatever, it could still get cold. But you mean put planter beds on the patio? Yeah, and in the backyard. I would love that. We just have to get rid of that couch thing that's out there and try to figure out how to work it. I can move okay. that sauna box. Yeah, that's mobile. I haven't even used it. I bought that thing trying to sweat it out, but yeah. I haven't even plugged it in yet. Or maybe I have. It's plugged in. I haven't haven't ran it yet. Um, I was hoping that riding these dirt bikes would make me super sore from all the you know exercise that I come because. It's a lot. Right. Like it's not just, you know, there's no pedaling, but mm -hmm. there's a lot. I'm exhausted afterwards. I'm just not sore. But I was hoping that I'd be super sore and that would help my my muscle soreness and shit. But I don't have it, so there's no reason to use it right now. Yeah. But I also want to get into I want to do more specialized content for Patreon. Okay. And I told you last night like how much money I would like to have to start doing the home apothecary thing. And I think that I want to start making videos of that, of me figuring this out on my own and then getting to that point. And I also want to start doing the cooking videos too. I just don't know how to do it with our kitchen layout. GoPros. And we own them now. Okay. And I bought another. Uh, we So we have three GoPros, mm -hmm. an Insta360 white one with the flip lid that I took to Vegas. It has a little camera on it. Yeah. And then I also ordered an Insta360 X3 today that does... The selfie stick that magically goes away mm -hmm. so you could get a 360 view of the kitchen or wherever you're working if you wanted to do that we could absolutely do that um and knowing that i can put a, a lav mic on you and hook it up to like a zoom mm -hmm. you can just put the zoom in your back pocket and we would have audio right and i don't have to use these big fucking cameras yeah 
that's doable. It's becoming more and more doable because of the amount of equipment I have. I have the Zoom recorder. Mm -hmm. Just clip that bitch on your back pocket. Yeah. Plug a mic directly into it. Golden. I actually have two Zooms because I bought the wrong one the first time and I refuse to send it back. So okay. we could do all of that. Um, and, and that's cool. I mean, it, I also, I think that um, because I want to double dip interviews, right? So like we did the African hippie on the garden. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Matt Bell that's going to drop this Friday, which will be way after you guys catch this. It'll have already been released. Um, I want to release the full content on those channels first for Patreon. And then after a month or so, then release them onto YouTube so that we can double dip. Right. Patreon gets the exclusive content for a while. Sometimes we post them, sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're obviously not not reposting all your garden episodes, so that is exclusive content. And I want to I want to start doing thoughts from the chair again. It helps me process stuff. Yeah. Um, but I always don't have I don't have things to say all the time. So like, unless I'm deep in that thought process and need to get it out, I I feel like it's just like, all right, mm. thoughts from the chair. Yeah. What are we going to talk about today? Like, you know what I mean. So I don't want to have a schedule for that. I just want it to be when I can do it, kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, still working on interviews trying to grow that a little bit. I, I think that when the studio rent is up, I don't want to do the studio again. And if we have internet here, I definitely don't want to do the studio again because we can do everything that we need to do at the house. Um, and we would just move every interview to Zoom interviews instead of doing like in-person interviews because we don't want people in our house. Right. But it doesn't make sense for what we're paying in that studio. We could have a second home in Tennessee right now. And I know that. Mm -hmm. And it sucks that we don't because... I would like to be in Tennessee a lot more than I'd like to be in Florida. So I can't wait until I start homeschooling the kids. Yeah. 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 It'll make travel a whole lot easier. That's for sure. Yeah. I have it figured out to where I can do it on my own. Like I won't need the support of other people to get it done. Did you actually look into all that? I did. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Did your aunt say she would help you with all the resources for that? Yes. She has all of the connections and links and bypasses and shortcuts. That's good. I wonder, um, if that's easier to do in Tennessee than it is in Florida because of the, uh, the satellite schooling that my sister was talking about. Right. Have to look into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Life is dope. Life is really dope. I feel super recharged and ready to attack all this shit. Yeah. I feel rejuvenated. I love not being on my phone. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to start season two. Like, I want to have a, because this, this year has been a fuck around and find out for us. Yes. Let's do the podcast. Let's do the side show. Let's do the side piece. Let's have three fucking episodes a week and two live streams and Patreon and garden episodes and interviews and like podcasts and advertisers. And we were trying to find a flow to all of this, which is why our schedule changed so much, because there was a lot of, a lot of change. This doesn't work. We don't have enough time. This works great, but time is still an issue. Like, right. And we're trying to navigate that and make it work to give you guys the content that you want and continue to still have a life for us while doing the other things that we're trying to do on the side. So I should have a T-shirt drop dropping this month on the 15th of December. I talked to Jeff Graham this morning. I should have two T-shirts designed from him. Oh. And, and I will have the protector shirts dropping this month because people keep asking for him. What are the designs for the shirt? Um, the dumpster fire one that we talked about and then the skull with the crown. He was supposed to start them last month. Well, skull with the crown. Yeah, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Oh. Speaks to the leadership and the the struggle and the sacrifice men make. So I figured we would do the dumpster fire as like a joke mm -hmm. because it's going to say neat on it because yeah. that was something I said on a podcast or on a live stream. Um, the protect her shirts. Every time somebody sees you in that shirt, they ask you, where did you get it? Yeah. People want it. So I'm going to make them. And if they sell great and if they don't, they don't, we'll just give them away as Christmas gifts or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the men's shirt heavy is the head that wears the crown. I, I want that for me. And if it, it works out great, I also think that I'm going to print the monkey on t-shirts and it's going to say you have the keys to your happiness because he's holding the keys while he's enslaved to the dollar. Um, and I would like to, to do something with that. Although I don't know how that's going to work. We bought a van. Yeah. We bought a sprinter van. Uh, and with the van, I'm going to put the um, the logo of the monkey on the back of the van. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the whole back of our van is that monkey. And then on the side, it'll say, to be better podcast. Are you going to do it like you did the truck, like full or? I don't. I am going to do a full wrap, but I don't think I'm going to go as busy. I, yeah. I think I want it to be simpler. Um, I, I think that I want to have a place for stickers. 
so that as we travel to places, we can put stickers on it, whether that's on the side, like back panel or something. Mm -hmm. But I would like to be able to put stickers on showing our travels. Yeah. Um, I do want to be able to use that van for meet and greets. That's something that I would like to start doing next year if possible. Okay. Um, like travel meet and greets? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, well, because we have security now. So we hired my cousin, Joe. For those of you guys who don't know, um, he came back into my life recently and um, it was really good timing. And now we have extra added security and I'm teaching him to edit and I'm going to teach him all the tech side of things and the camera things so that next year when we're out doing stuff, we'll have somebody that can film B-roll and like do the camera thing so that we can be together versus one of us being behind the camera. Right. Because that sucks. It, it makes it so that it's not an us thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. I want to experience life with you, not behind a fucking screen. Right. You know, so having him there to do those kind of things will be super fucking dope. And I have people like Dakota. I know that if I'm doing something in Tennessee, I can make a phone call and within a week I could have security there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I could contact Steve and be like, hey, in March, we're traveling for one week. I need to make sure that you're on point. Like, and, and I've started looking into getting Joe a class G license, which is armed security so that he can carry his license outside of just Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and in the event that he has to use it, there's laws that are, you know, he'll have all that structure. Right. Uh, so that that's that would be one of those things that I would like to be able to do meet and greets. And I figure that's something that we could do at like restaurants or rent out a venue and then just charge tickets to make up for that so that mm -hmm. we can sit down and, and do that. I think that would be an evolution for the podcast for us, for sure. Um, what would you want to do with those meet and greets? You just want to do like Q&A's? Are we going to be doing live like email readings? I don't know if I would even want to work. I got to be honest, I think it would be cool to just interact with people. Yeah. Maybe maybe an hour or like if we're going to do a meet and greet, we could have a couple that's going to come and like try to work on some of their problems on stage or some, I, I don't know. I haven't put much thought into, I just want to be able to interact with people in real life. Um, everybody that's met us that has ranted about how, you know, we're, we are who we are. Like, mm -hmm. and, and I think that it's important for people to like actually see that from us and like get to, to interact with us in real life because we're just two dorky people that are filming our conversations. Like there's nothing really special about us. Right. I, at least I don't think there is. I, I really think that you and I are just two people that have really good chemistry and we're able to, to vibe well. Mm -hmm. And I think that people want that and some people have it and recognize it and think that's super dope. I'd also like to get Matt Bell, but Mel, Matt Bell to come back down. Um, we have a lot of work to do before we go on vacation again. We have a lot of people coming in. Um, I'm going to start doing business interviews with people in the studio, like local business owners to talk about what their struggles were as opening businesses, because I think that would help the men's group. Mm -hmm. I also think that I'm going to, to restructure the men's group because I was, I told you yesterday that I was done with it. I was going to drop it all together. And last night while I was on TikTok, somebody tagged me in a comment and it was like normalizing men's social groups or something like that and somebody tagged me and was like he has one of these on his patreon it is a fucking asset and like they just hyped me up dude and like talked about how great the the interaction is with other men it's a support group blah 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 blah. and like knowing that people feel that way about it regardless of how i feel about it i don't feel right just ending it because people are getting value from it so i'm i'm probably going to have to restructure that in 2024 and try to find a better plan for that um i don't know I don't know. I have a lot of things that I want to accomplish and a lot of things that I want to be a part of, but I don't want to half-ass it. And if I can't devote myself to it to make it work and me be happy with it, I have a very hard time proceeding and right. like continuing with it because um, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a, a very big market for that. And a lot of people who really need help, I just don't have the time to be everyone's coach. And like doing it in discord where I have to check the discord and like check on things and be active in a chat is a lot different than one-on-one. -on -one. And maybe I start doing one-on-one -on -one shit like I'm doing with Jordan. And like, I mean, granted that's a lot more work, but there's a lot more revenue involved. And like, if I'm making that kind of money, I can justify answering emails or a phone call at three o'clock in the morning. Like, right. so I, I don't know. I want to, I want to evolve all of that too. So 2024 is going to be interesting. I am excited. Yeah. I've put a lot of thought into the garden. Yeah. 
I have the next three episodes planned out. I have part three of the Gypsy Rose saga figured out. That What a fucking doozy. Yeah? Oh, my gosh. I'm going to start it off with reading the text messages between Nick and Gypsy and then going into their police interrogations because I feel like with the black background... I feel like with the background information between the text messages, their interrogations, um, just things make more sense in my mind. There's going to be a part four of that. Would you like me to get you a hair tie? No. This is the second time you've pulled your hair back like that to get it out of your face. I'm just, I'm fiddling with it. I'm tired of wearing my hair up. Yeah. But it's so frizzy and all over the place and bushy. You should get a keratin treatment. What is a keratin treatment? It will flatten your hair. It okay. won't frizz. It'll be straight if you want to straighten it. And it'll just be like that for months. I would love to do that. We have to find somebody local that we can trust that can do that. Okay. I know people that do it, but I don't know if I would want that. Yeah. I have, um, I finished the proper care and feeding of a marriage or of a husband. What'd you think of that? I liked it. She's very sassy. I did not get to listen to a single audio book. Out of no. all of that driving because my cousin was with me. Wow. He doesn't he doesn't like listening to people talk. So I put it on and I could tell he was starting to get annoyed, so I just shut it off. Huh. And I left my fucking AirPods here on the counter on the charger. I'm so sorry. And I realized <laughs> that we were in like Gainesville. Yeah. Fuck. That won't happen again. Yeah. That really does suck. That was a twelve hour drive. Yeah. It was fourteen on the way back. That's insane. I finished that book. I made a lot of notes. I'm going to make that into an episode of The Garden. I am currently listening to Fascinating Women for the Timeless Woman. And I've already made a bunch of notes on that. So that's probably going to be an up two-parter. I want to... I have so many plans for The Garden. Yeah. I want to talk about self-evolution. Um, how to cope with losing people in your life because you're changing. I want to talk about motherhood. I want to talk about what it's like being a woman in just society and... I have a lot of plans for the garden. Are these things that you want to monologue or things that you want to have a dialogue with people about? Um, Right now, I'm just planning it as a monologue. It would be really cool if you could find people to have conversations with, like you did with the, the military chick, mm-hmm. um, based off of this specific subject. Yeah. Especially if you could find like experts in fields. That would, that would be so game-changing. Mm-hmm. I watch I watch podcasts still, listen to them from time to time. And I see people that we know that are doing crazy shit with like networking and getting to meet all these other people and we're so recluse that we don't really do that. Yeah. And even though we're like Marco the Pizza Man, you're doing that cooking episode with him, which will be a Patreon release. Um conservative ant will be there so like we'll get to have these people around and you've become friends with Lauren the mortician and like I have Brandon from all things testosterone and Troy and like we have our little network of people and I have Rick Mm -hmm. and I have people that I can reach out to to like meet other creators I just have I am so fucking horrible about keeping a conversation (laughs) going because I'm so busy that I don't have time for it yeah and I think that um as this grows we may want to start looking into other things as well in terms of um agencies to find guests like Lauren did Okay. Because I, I'm not willing to do what she did because I'm not willing to give up a lot of this, but I, I, I need somebody that can do the fine vet, all of that shit. And we have people in play right now that are supposed to be doing those things. It's just not happening the way that I want it to happen. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to get a drink. Okay. Would you like something while I'm up? No, I'm good. Thank you. We need to find a sponsorship. We do. For energy drinks. So if you know somebody, mm-hmm. we Let need us a sponsorship. Know. Uh, two more things I want to say before we move on, because I'll forget about it. Okay. I am going to be ordering the stuff for the bath line before the end of the month or next month. Okay. Um, I have things added in the carts. There's just a couple of websites are very confusing for me. Th- that doesn't matter. It's going to be about, probably be about $700 Okay. for all of that stuff. So that's the price. I'll let you know when it's on already. On top of the, epo- uh, the other things that you wanted to do? Yes. Okay. And then the apothecary thing, I need to get the geckos their new tank. Okay. I need to get that done. Why? Because that tank is abysmal. What? Um. I want to do the whole self-sustaining eco thing. For oh, them. yeah, yeah, the terrarium. Yeah. Okay, I was like, I don't understand why that's relevant to apothecary. But, well, because I want to redo that whole area. That's where I want to put all that stuff at. Okay. 
You know that we have a laboratory out there yeah. from when I was doing mycology. Well, it's very enclosed. Right. Well, I mean, that's good because there's sterile air in there. Yeah. So if you're doing anything with fragrances or whatever, or you need an air conditioned area, mm -hmm. uh, it was just a thought. I have um, flow, flow hoods in there. Yeah. I have one that blows vertical and one that blows out. Oh, wow. So I never got rid of them. I almost did twice, and I'm glad I didn't because eventually I would like to get back into that, but mm -hmm. time. Right. Okay, let's let's do some emails. Uh, episode 52 for you guys, we said earlier that we wanted to run for about three hours. That episode is literally going to be updates on people's lives and thank yous, uh, and it will be a Christmas release. So if you have a Christmas morning where you've got a whole bunch of people in your house and you can pop an AirPod in, 9 a.m. Christmas Day, episode 52, will be the last episode of the year. And then season two of the To Be Better podcast will start in January. Do you want to try this? What is that? It is overnight oats, peanut butter and jelly. No. Are you sure? I'm going to act like our son right now. I don't like it. Why? <laughs> it looks. It's really good. Is it? It is. Fuck. Give it here. I, I'm trying to. I don't. I don't like this. It's less than 500 calories and like 16 grams of carbs. It looks like a block of like health food. You're going to like it. You're right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to eat better. I don't like the texture, but the flavor is there. I'm absolutely disgusted with myself right now. I feel that. I have, however, lost weight while we were gone. Me too. So... I'm out there riding around in the woods, right? While you're looking for this email, I'm going to tell a story. And I'm going downhill and I'm braking and the bike is sliding down the fucking hill. The tires are completely locked up until it hits a bump and then they roll and lock back up. Burnt through my brakes while we were there. Um, and all I could think of the whole time is if I was 50 pounds lighter, this would be so much easier to do because I wouldn't be so heavy on the bike sliding and like I might, I might be like a, a weight anti-lock brake system. Right. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that's not how it works, but in my head it was. And all I think of is like, okay, I'm going to just eat one, one less meal this week, every day, one less meal, mm -hmm. just because it's less calorie intake. Yeah. I know that's not how you diet, but I'm also not bodybuilding. I'm still lifting weights, but I'm not trying to be jacked ever again. After ripping my titty, I don't want to do that, but I don't want to be 250 pounds anymore, 240 pounds or whatever I am right now, because mm -hmm. I want to be able to ride those dirt bikes. And the lighter I am, the longer the range is. So much so that I was at 20% and you were at 45 because I outweigh you by like 60 pounds. That's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm about 190 right now. I want to get down to 170. You got this. 170 has always been my goal. I was nine pounds short of it and then I gained a bunch of weight. It's because we got comfortable. Yeah. I, I think it's less of being comfortable and more of I don't have time to cook like I want yeah, to. It was 100% the podcast Yeah, because we were so busy. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is titled Marriage Question. First off, oh, this is only one page. This is so short. There's also one in the high priority that I asked for. Okay, we'll do that next. My question. So when my husband and I got married, I worked off and on because I always had a lot of anxiety and PTSD that affected my work. So it had been hard for me to keep a job. I always knew I wanted to be a stay-at-home wife and mom. He has always been the main breadwinner. Well, when I found out I was pregnant in November of 2022, our main goal was to find a way for me to be able to become a stay-at-home completely. So we ended up finding a better-paying job that offered benefits, paid time off, etc. But now, a few months later, we're finding that he's really not happy at this job. We both don't think it's worth the emotional and physical strain on him to keep this job. That being said, it's been hard to find something else, and now the idea of me going back to work has come up since it's looking like anything he would be able to find work-wise would not match the salary he makes now. I'm not sure what to do since we had already discussed staying at home, but now that the plan might not but now that, that plan might be changing, it would be very it would be fuck me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> You're editing this? Oh, fuck, you're so hot. You're just smiling at me. <laughs> but now that that plan might be changing, it would be a very hard adjustment. I'm not sure if I'm overreacting by feeling like he should be the one to find a new job and not settle for something that I would also have to work. But then I feel bad for making him assume all the responsibility financially. And that's the end of the email. This is the struggle of man. 
this is a lot to process. Um, have you addressed the anxiety and the PTSD that would affect your work? Because if not, you guys are going to fall back into the same cycle of you not being able to hold a job. And if I were a man, I would start harboring a resentment towards that because this is 100% something that you can actively work on to get under control. Right. I don't want to go back to work. I don't. If you came to me one day and said, look, everything is failing and I need you to get a job nine to five, I would be kind of devastated by it because I've worked. I've been a single mom. I've supported myself. I've paid my own rent. All of that shit. And that was when I was the most severely depressed, most suicidal, like I am not somebody who can cope under that amount of stress and be mentally okay. With you, it's different. I worked when we first got together, so it was alleviated. Working was not as hard mentally for me as it was when everything was on my shoulders, maintaining the household and everything outside of it. I don't want to give up my freedoms. Right. Most people don't. <laughs> I, I love being at home and waking up and getting the kids ready for school and taking them and then coming home and cleaning and meal prepping or working on an episode for the garden or doing research on herbs or working on my plants outside or falling asleep in a hammock in the sun. My life is fantastic. I, yeah, I would be devastated if you were like, babe, I know that this is going to be a hard conversation. I need you to get a job. But would you do it? I would. Okay. So that's that's the teamwork, right? Mm -hmm. Because right now I will work myself to death to make sure that that doesn't have to happen. Can you imagine how hard it would be for me to come to you to have that conversation? So while you would be devastated, right, where I would be in that moment would be fucking just as bad. And I recognize that. So it, that you would, I need to gather myself because <laughs> I'm jumping from thought to thought right. to thought to thought. If you came to me and said, "I need you to get a job." Like hat in hand, you're fucking, you are on your knees, devastated that you have to ask your wife to help contribute financially because as a man, in our view, you are the provider. You're supposed to be doing all of that. In my devastation, I would have to recognize that you coming to me is 100% your last resort. And I bet you would rather eat a bullet than ask me that. Yeah, yeah, I would. So, it, so that's the conversation, right? That's the conversation that we need to have right now over this email. Okay. Because he gave her that life. Right. She didn't want to work anymore. And she was able to, to be a stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home wife, whatever it was that she said she was doing. Mm -hmm. He was able to find a better job. And now he hates that job. Hating your job and not being able to do your job are two different things. Right. You don't have to like your job. Mm -hmm. You're there to catch a paycheck. You can go to work, keep your head down, do your job, ignore people, suffer if that's what your job is hard. Right. And then work your way up the ladder if that's what it takes. Right. You don't have to like your job. You don't have to like your coworkers. You're there for a paycheck. You're selling your time to a company to earn. Right. If he's not happy and he's in that field and it's the company he doesn't like, then he needs to find another company that does the same thing and just move his job. Right. Take the skill. Go out, work elsewhere. Right. If that's the issue, mm -hmm. we don't. We she didn't say what the issue was right. in, that, in hating his job. Is it the actual work itself? Like, was he a carpenter and now he's doing electrician work? Yeah. Because that's two totally different universes. And that's also a different conversation, like you're saying. Right. But that would also speak to time because the longer you do something, the more efficient you become at it. And the longer you're at a job, if you're a good worker and you're not missing work, and you're not late and like you are decent to your coworkers and you're decent to the boss and you're able to pull your weight, like you can move up mm -hmm. most of the time. Obviously, that's not always the case. Some some positions are just finite. Right. Um, but that situation speaks a lot to how hard it would be for him to admit his shortcomings because that's exactly what that is. Him quitting his job because he doesn't like it is very different than him quitting his job because he can't do it. Right. Right. Like if he's got back pain and he's doing backbreaking labor, it's very fucking hard to do that job for a long duration because eventually you're not going to be able to do it. That's, you know, okay. wear and tear on the body. That's a different scenario. I blew right. my knee out. I can't fucking work on an oil rig now. Like, yeah. That's a different scenario. Well, well, she did say that they both agree that it's not worth the emotional and the physical strain on him. Physical strain is, that's a sliding scale. Yeah. Physical strain and physical pain are two different things. Hard work is hard work. Right. It also, if he went from like a desk job where right. he's working in finances and accounting and now he's doing hard labor for 14 hours a day. Good. We're not meant to sit behind a desk. Right. Suck it the fuck up. If, if that's the physical strain though, like... 
if you want the money and you want to be able to provide that life for your wife, you, that's what you have to do. So what matters more at that point? Your right. mental strain and physical strain. I can, I'm not downplaying mental health, but what matters most? Mm -hmm. Your family and your ability to provide or failing at something you said you could do and then having to backtrack. Right. Because if that was me, I would look at myself as a failure. I offered this life to you. We have an agreement. Mm -hmm. I have certain things that I have to uphold on my end, the struggle of man, because I have to do these things because this is what I said I was going to do. My word means more to me mm -hmm. than, you know, that's important. So right. if I'm like, I ask you to quit your job and six months later, you're living your best fucking life and we're struggling financially and I have to swallow my pride and be like, hey, we're about to lose everything. I need right. some help. And you were like, fuck you. And there was a big blow up over it. I, I probably would just go ahead and control a delete because at that point, like, what's the point? Right. Like, I, this is supposed to be the one person I can lean on in this world. Right. I need help. Yeah. Are you going to help me? No, you're going to throw up my face that I'm failing you and make a big fucking deal out of it and saying instead of going, all right, what do you need me to do? Right. You, you know what I mean? Like this could be an opportunity of you have given me what I've asked for out of our marriage. Like I want this in life and you've given it to me. I've had a taste of what it's like. I'm going to do everything that I can to get back to this point because I know you fucking felt like the man doing this for me. Right. And me being home, I'm happy. In turn, we are happy. The greatest thing a woman can give her husband is herself. And if you are happiest being a stay at home mom, you are part of the team that got you to that point. Right. You're going to have to pull up the sleeves and get to it. Yeah. This speaks to a support system. Yeah. In the event that this became a huge problem and he continued to suffer to provide this life, he knows that he's doing it without a teammate. Right. That conversation would, would alter his thought process on this. If I came to you and was like, look, we're fucking struggling and I need help. We're going to lose the house. Yeah, even even if I didn't even just yeah. just in the we are struggling and I need help. If you were to give me attitude and and like throw it back at me and make me feel like shit over it or like create some sort of tension over us, mm -hmm. I wouldn't feel like a team. I would feel like I'm fucking killing myself to give you the life that you're living and you don't give a fuck about me in the process and here right. I am struggling. The least that you could do is be like I got you, you know? Like I just want to comment on how fucked up it is. If your man comes to you and you feel anything besides genuine concern and compassion about him struggling, like you need to reevaluate everything going on in your life and your marriage. I could never imagine you coming to me and going, babe, I'm, I'm really going through it right now and I need your help. And me going, what the fuck is it this time? Right. That's hypotheticals. She said that, that they had the conversation. Right, yeah. That's right. a pure hypothetical. Okay. Yeah. I don't want people to be like, they're attacking the emailer because no. that's not okay. That's uh, that's exactly it. And and that would change our entire dynamic for the rest of our lives because I would know that at the end of the day, I do not matter, mm -hmm. that I, I am simply here to provide an existence for you. And when I am no longer able to function in that manner, you're gone. Because that's the way that those situations would be perceived. Right. If you're not willing to struggle with me and fucking get in the mud and make things happen... I don't want to, I can do this by myself. It's a yeah. whole lot easier with one person than it is with two or three or four or five. If you've got kids, mm -hmm. this is all a matter of perspective. So I've processed a lot in this. So you would come to me and say, I need your help. I need you to go back to work. And then it would be a conversation of how long am I going back to work for? I, I need like an end date on this. I am not going to go back to work for the next 30 or 40 years and be absolutely miserable in a marriage where we agreed that we were going to have the traditional lifestyle of me staying home, you working, I take care of the household and all of that. Um, so I, it would be a conversation of how long do you need me to work for? And that is an adjustable scale. Right. If you say, I need you to work for six months, we're coming up on four months and like, look, babe, we don't have the savings I thought we would have because of we had to replace a car. I'm going to need you to work for at least a year. Okay. Like I get it. We need the second car, right. whatever the conversation is. There would also be a conversation of thank you. You know, you did give me this for however long it was. Happiest I've ever been. I recognize that you put yourself in situations that weren't ideal or situations you otherwise would not have put yourself in just to make me happy. If I weren't here, you wouldn't have done that shit. Right. So there would be an, an, an ounce of gratitude and all of that. And then it would be a, a pep talk of like, look, I know that you're probably fucking depressed right now. 
I understand that you have not understand. I'm assuming that you have gone back and forth in this conversation in your head for a while before approaching me and asking me this. Um, thank you for asking me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be your teammate. And we're going to fucking do this. And it's all perspective. It is. It is because, like I said, I would be devastated. And my initial reaction would be, what the fuck? Like, out of the blue, you're hitting me with my life is going to change completely. It's all about how you regulate yourself. And you recognize who you're speaking to. This isn't your boss. This is not your shitty coworker you have to clean up after. This is not your irritating mother. This is somebody you've dedicated yourself for the rest of your life with, who you promise that through anything, you're going to make it work and you're not going to be shitty towards one another. Life disruptions are going to happen. Life is not always going to go your way. Tell that to the kids all the time. You're not always going to get what you want. Choose your hard. Right. Choose your heart. So there's, and there's a lot, this is a, this is a big conversation. This is not a simple one email thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like normally we would have moved on by now. Right. So let's talk about how this would look because there are things that they could do. They could cut back on spending. They could downsize their lives. If they have three cars, they could sell one of them, get rid of a car payment. There's things that they could do to, you know, they could cancel all their fucking subscription accounts and like right. they could really live off ramen for a while. They could do things to pull themselves out of that. Mm -hmm. He could get a second job, right? But how fair is that to him to have to sacrifice all of that and get a second job to do the things just so that she can continue to live that life and, and be as free as she wants while he's working himself to death? Right. Because it's not teamwork. I want that Bonnie and Clyde shit. If you're not willing to go to war with me when I need to go to war, I don't want you. And, and men are going to feel that way. Mm -hmm. We don't want trophy wives. We want teammates. You think that people who are like, super rich billionaires go home at the end of the day and just fucking go about their life and don't bring their work problems home and talk to their woman. It doesn't happen that way. I unload everything on you and you're my sounding board. Yeah. <clears throat> we made a hundred thousand dollar decision yesterday. We did. We made that decision. I handle the finances. It's my responsibility, but I still need to, what are you smirking at? Not me going, we spent a hundred thousand dollars yesterday. I remember the conversation, <laughs> but I really, it, it, I trust you so much with everything. I, we talk about money so much. Right. And we're always moving money. You said $100,000. And I was like, oh, we did have that conversation, didn't we? Obviously, it wasn't at 100000 It was over right. multiple things, but it, it equals hundred grand. Well, it's like ninety-two or 93000 It's close enough. Right. Um, but yeah, that was our decision. You asked me, how do you feel about that? And I told you how I felt about it. I gave you my opinions on things, my perspectives on things, and together we unanimously unanimously made a decision on what that money is going to be for. Right. You do have final decision making, which we have said prior, and I will stand by. I love that. You well, that also making. came up yesterday. What do you mean? Uh, in the, the the van truck thing, because you really want a new oh, minivan, yeah. And it's either we buy one straight out or we roll the Jeep in mm -hmm. to get the minivan and the negative equity on the Jeep is not worth it to me. Right. So do we just buy you a minivan and keep the Jeep and keep the Jeep payment, give my cousin the Jeep or whatever, mm -hmm. or give it to somebody else so that they have another company vehicle? There are options there. Right. And we had that discussion, but my need to make you happy was like, all right, we're going to go to the dealership tomorrow. You're getting a fucking van. You yeah. Know? Your, your need to make me happy is very overpowering to a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain that? Because I felt like shit yesterday. I can tell that you're willing to put logic aside to make me happy. Yeah. Like you will bend logic however the fuck you need to, to make sure that you make me happy. We almost made a really stupid move with that yesterday. And I, had, <laughs> I had thought about it a lot after we had already made plans to go today. and was like, I really think we should just wait for like two months yeah. to make a decision on this. Uh, and I'm still on the fence because I know right now I could make it happen. I just... Right. It, but I am also okay <clears throat> with waiting until January. Time doesn't exist for me. Yeah. We've been back from Tennessee for three days and it feels like three weeks. Like it, January, February, March, you could tell me next August and they'll be here before I know it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not, I, I, you are a man of your word. And when you tell me something is going to happen, I don't care what the time frame is. I know that you will die to make it happen. Yeah. Yep. It's a lot. Anyways, so that... Wait, that, do you think that speaks to why I'm so willing to be your teammate? Like, if, it, if there a conversation happened where you're like, I need you to go back to work, 
do you think that the way that you are as a man and my confidence in you, my trust in you and our loyalty to one another is why I am so willing and able to be your teammate in these things? Uh, I think that that's a huge part of it. Yeah. I, I think the way that you respond, because you never really react. There are times that we both react to each other. Yeah. It's few and far between. And normally once it happens, we realize that we've reacted and like we have to backpedal and, and work our way back through things. But that's, again, it's few and far between. And it's normally mm -hmm. when we can't have a conversation. If it's a text message thing or there's people around, it, it, things get cloudy. That's yeah. just going to happen. It is your response to things. If I came to you and you blew up on me or you had a negative reaction to me asking you for your help, I'm not asking you anymore. Oh, yeah, that would be a one-time thing. And then I would ask you, well, why don't you ever ask me for help if you're so stressed out? Right, because I know the outcome of it. There's no point. Right. This is, again, this is the man's struggle. This is one of those things that we are... It's required of us. Right. You you look at, it's more prevalent now than ever before. It's in everyone's face. But now it's promoted as pro-women. Men's struggles don't matter. So like when we are having these conversations, there is a real conversation to be had here. And there's people who watch the podcast who get it. But for people who are new here, they're going to hear me complaining about this shit. They're going to be like, this is just another man complaining. And they're going to move on past the podcast because they don't fucking get it. Well, the people that who think that... The women specifically who think, oh, it's just another man complaining. Men feel the exact same way about you. Are you hungry, babe? Did you hear that? <laughs> I do am, you, actually. Do you need anything, daddy? Uh, I, <laughs> it's uh, 11 o'clock, and all I've had was an energy drink and a soda. Do you want me to order lunch? No. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'm not. Okay. I, I, it's digesting yesterday's okay. dinner. That's the way I'm looking at it. I don't know where, like along the line of human evolution where we just lost the uh, cognitive thought process, I suppose, to be able to recognize that everybody's going through something. It's compassion. We've, we've lost that. And it's been, it's been bought out of us. Elaborate on that. It's so been bought out it's of been, us. we've bought ourselves out of compassion, right? Because it used to be every Sunday night, families would get together and talk about their week. Yeah. And if, if, uh, you know, your cousin Billy is having a hard time financially. The family would get together and buy groceries or take the kids an extra night a week to make sure that everybody's taken care of. As the family dynamic has gotten smaller and smaller and the homes have gotten bigger and bigger, we don't have that connection. Look at the way things felt in Tennessee. Oh, it was like night and day. I actually had a conversation with your brother about that. You know, I, I, I thanked your family for accepting me as their own. Thanksgiving was not uncomfortable. It was a fucking blast. Like everybody was there. There were people I didn't meet, like new children, new people. Um, and it was just, it was one big family. Growing up, it was just me, my mom, my sister. The three of us, that was it. We were secluded from family. We never went to any family outings. We didn't really have any friends over because my childhood was a mess. I don't want people seeing that shit. So going from... It literally just being a single family unit to having extended family and meeting new people and extended relatives. It's, it was very overwhelming and it felt very cozy. Okay. So with the experience that you had, okay. if any of them called you tomorrow and was like, I need something, you would do it. Yeah. Because you know that if you called any of them tomorrow and was like, Hey, I'm struggling right now. Can you help me? They would. Right. They would find a way to make it happen. It might not be the way that you're looking for, right? but they will find a way to do for each other because that's what, that's what things used to be. So as we are buying the name brand clothes and buying the shiny cars and buying the bigger houses and cutting people out of our lives because we can't have a conversation about politics or faith or love, mm. or people want to bash each other's partners and, and or, all of that ugliness. Or the control that's... Ex um not excluded, exuded, the control that's exuded right. by family members that or close <clears throat> friends who think that they have your best interest at heart because that's what, not what they would do. All of it is because they want to sell us shit. Mm -hmm. And the more unhappy we are, the more likely we are to spend our money to get a dopamine response to fill that void. Prime example, you're having a shitty day. You're going to go to Starbucks. There's 15 bucks. You leave Starbucks. You got a new cup. If you collect the cups, your drink inside of it. Oh, I'm still feeling kind of down, but I feel a little bit better. Maybe go to Hobby Lobby or Target or an art store and walk around for the next two hours. You're not leaving there not spending money. The average person spends more than a dollar a minute at Walmart. 
So when you're window shopping and you're leaving, that $30 item has become a $350 expense. Now you're in debt and you have to work a little bit harder, which isolates you a little bit more, which makes you fucking depressed, which makes you want the dopamine response. So we are buying ourselves out of compassion. Mm -hmm. And moms do that a lot. Because they're isolated and alone. Right. Well, not, not even just that. When you're out with the kids, mom, I want this. Mom, I want that. Can you just shut up for one? Yes. Right. Yes. Get, grab what you want. Put it in the cart. I, you're right. And now we're, we're teaching our children that. I grew up on retail therapy. Right. Right. I'm sad. I'm upset. Oh, your feelings are hurt. Let's go out and spend money. It always makes me feel better. It's learned behavior. Yeah. And it comes from marketing. And the psyops that was done on right. us during the 19th century. Like, if you buy this, it'll make you happy. Buy right. this new thing and your marriage will be better. If you bought this, right. your skin's going to look tighter. You'll look younger. Right. You'll be happier. Buy this new thing so that when you're around people, they will be the envy of your new, new items. And that's going to create another dopamine response. So you buy that new shiny and you show up and your friends are like, yo, that's amazing. What the fuck, dude? That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And then that feeling goes away. Now you're looking at the next thing. What can I do to get that dopamine response again? So now you're spending money and you're chasing that high. So you are buying yourself out of compassion. How does one regain compassion for their, for their spouse? Uh, for their spouse? Yeah. Let's tie this back into the email. This comes down to that Bonnie and Clyde thing. If your life is worth living... Ooh, that's probably not the right way to word it, but I'm going to run with it because I said it. If your white life is worth living without your person, that's not the right person to you. If you and I were doing things and I, I'm struggling and I, I am trying to find a foothold and I'm climbing this sheer fucking cliff and I'm carrying you and the kids and all the business and all of that shit is a, 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 a rock. Every one of those things are rocks of varying sizes. And here I am trying to climb a wall and you're down there sipping Starbucks, living your fucking life. And I'm up there dying, trying to pull everyone along. I don't want to do that. Right. Who the fuck wants to do that? I want to see you on the rock bearing some of that fucking weight with me so that we can get to the top of this motherfucker and live good. In that analogy, I have the children and all the home responsibilities on my back climbing next to you. Right. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. But if I came to you and I'm like, okay, all of this other shit is too much. I need you to carry some of this and you're not willing to do it. And I'm already carrying all of this and I'm still helping over here like... Yeah. You're on your own. Yeah. Have fun. Because that's what I'm doing on my own already. I, 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 this, this email is a lot. That's a lot to it process. Is. I'm glad that they had the conversation about um, his mental struggles and physical stress. I'm sorry, mental stresses and phys physical stresses. But the idea of her having a possible resentment for having to go back to work or having a look, nobody's going to be happy. They got to go to work. Nobody wants to fucking work. Going to work sucks. You remember the first paycheck you got and you're thinking you get a whole bunch of money and you realize how much taxes they took? Like, that shit sucks. I sold all my fucking time when I could be hanging out with my friends and riding bikes and doing all this cool shit, playing video games, whatever, mm -hmm. drinking. And I just sold 50 hours of my week and after the government laid the dick down, I've got a sore ass and a fucking half of a paycheck. Like, it sucks. Nobody yeah. wants to do it. But if you want to thrive in life, you have to, to find ways to work the game to be successful. And it's a lot easier if you have a partner. That's why we built the team that we have. It's why I have so many people around me right now that I'm trying to level to do things because the more successful they get and the more they have to hire, the closer my social setting is going to get and the more that we can bounce and network off of each other. I, I'm doing it. It's just, it's a lot slower than I want it to be. Yeah. But I have built a network of people that I fucking trust and I can make a phone call and go, this is what needs to be done today. And if you can't do it, I'm going to call them and they're going to do it. And like, if I can't find people in my network, I'm hiring somebody. Mm -hmm. But it's not like, that's a luxury. When you're doing it all on your own, that's not a luxury. I was talking to somebody this morning in the men's group about social media because he has a forge. And I don't remember his TikTok account, but he's, he has a forge. He's a blacksmith. And he's trying to build his social media account. And he's like, I didn't realize how hard it was because I read all these books and they make it sound easy. And social media is not. We do a two-hour episode of the podcast, and it's 15 hours minimum of work for a two-hour episode mm -hmm. from, from email screening to finished product, clips, all of that. So for somebody who's just getting started on social media and doesn't understand the metrics and doesn't understand cameras and doesn't understand audio and doesn't understand all of that and doesn't have a team, they have to learn all that work. I did that. It took me a long fucking time to get the knowledge that I have of cameras and audio and editing before we even started the podcast because I've done this in the past and it's failed. So knowing the knowledge that I have from photography and all of that shit, I have a leg up, which made us hit the ground running 
and we didn't have to learn all those fucking errors, right? Mm -hmm. So even for people who want to do social media, there's a struggle there. If you don't have the team, you have to do it on your own. That falls back into everything that we were saying before. If you've got to do it on your own, you got to do it on your own. And this comes into sometimes you got to work a second job. Sometimes that second job is your hobby Mm -hmm. to try to build something. But if you don't have the teamwork and your partner Mm -hmm. and you're trying to do all these things to try to be successful and they're drinking Starbucks hanging from your fucking rope, where's the team? You have to have that. You can can only do so much on your own is what I was getting at with all of that. I can do all the editing. I can do all the audio. I can do all the clipping. I can do everything that this podcast needs solely on my own and I will have zero free time. The tattoo shop will get zero of my attention, which already is not getting a lot of my attention, but I have general management there and other people involved in that. You wouldn't get my attention. The kids wouldn't get my attention. I wouldn't go ride dirt bikes. I wouldn't be able to take vacations. I would be solely focused on working, editing, clipping content. But how long would I have to do that? I did it myself. I had AJ, but I was still doing all of the editing Mm -hmm. in the beginning for at least the first six months. And then he started clipping. I paid an extra clipper for a short amount of time. And now we have a team. Mm -hmm. I've slowly built that team so that I can back off and enjoy my life a little bit. That struggle happens. If this is what this man has to do for a little while, I hate to be the guy that says, suck it the fuck up. But like, tell her you're struggling, find a way to have her be your teammate and and make that shit work. Mm -hmm. And if you are unable to do that, you need to be fucking clear and be like, I can't do this. It's not that I don't want to. It's that I, it's too much physically demanding and I'm going to lose myself if I have to do it. I'm going to lose my marriage. I'm going to lose my kids. I'm going to lose all of that because I'm going to dedicate all my time into this and I'm not going to have anything left for anything else. This is no different than women not taking self-care. Yeah. I'm also thinking about if she does have to go to work, she needs to go to work with her strengths. If you're not a people person and interacting with phone calls or something increases your anxiety, go work at a pet store. Work overnight at Walmart. Yeah. Do you remember the rucksack metaphor that I gave earlier on in the podcast? No. The hardest part of doing a ruck, a ruck is a, oh, yes, I do remember that. a hike with like a 50 pound bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, and since I've started the metaphor, I'm just going to finish it. Okay. If you have to do a ruck, let's say it's a 10 mile ruck with 50 pounds on your back. The hardest part of that ruck is not the walk. It's stopping to take a break, taking your pack off and putting your pack back on. Mm-hmm. Because you know that you have to carry this fucking bag while your back hurts, your knees hurts, it's rubbing your traps raw. It sucks ass. And you know that you have to put this backpack back on when your timed break is up. If you're military, you know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. Your 10 minute rest is up and you have to put that back on and you're looking at it and you're like, I could quit right now. Right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that, that's what that, that, that's where the teamwork comes in. You let's say you've done nine of your 10 miles and your shoulders are raw. Your knees are achy. Your back is achy. And your person recognizes that you're struggling and pulls 20 pounds out of that rucksack. That 50 pound rucksack feels real fucking light right now while you're passing that last mile to the finish line because you had just a little bit of assistance. <clears throat> Putting that ruck back on is not going to be like, fuck, I, I don't want to do this. I could quit. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, they're going to help me. Oh, I got this then. Fuck it. Let's run. You know what I mean? Like, right. I, I, I think that that matters. It does. Your marriage is a ruck. It is. Also, <clears throat> if a woman takes some of that weight off of that man, that man needs to understand she's going to move slower. Yeah. Life is going to move slower. Right. You you can't get frustrated with her because now her life has also changed a little bit. She's she's picking up things that she no, no, typically doesn't. Right. If we were walking five miles and four miles into that, you were like, I need you to carry 30 pounds. It's going to take us a lot longer to do that last mile. Right. So at that point, I am being your support and picking up that weight. And you are also being my support and understanding that I'm going to struggle a little bit carrying this for you. Right. But that first four miles where I carried everything mm-hmm. was super fucking fast because I was doing it. Right. So that little bit of extra time that we spent on that fifth mile to get to the finish line, mm-hmm. you're fresh. Right. You just had a normal stroll while I'm fucking struggling carrying everything. That mm-hmm. little bit of extra time means fucking nothing. Yeah. We finished. Mm-hmm. And that's the important part. We did that shit together as a team. I will bear the weight of the world as long as I fucking can. But when you see that I can't do it anymore, that little bit of fucking help goes a long way. Sometimes that help is like, babe, I love you and thank you for the life that you've given me. Mm -hmm. Oh, I could do more. You want to see me do more? Watch this. Right? Sometimes it's grace. Sometimes it's appreciation and recognition of the struggle that we go through. It could be 
completely psychological. Men will go through a lot and we will just push it down and push it down and push it down until we're ready to break. And we won't say shit about it because we know that there's no point. What are you going to do about it? Throw it in our face later. Tell us that we're weak. Tell us that we're being a pussy and that we need to suck it up. Tell us that it's okay to be vulnerable. And then when we actually are, it becomes a problem in the marriage. We know better. So we fucking suffer and suffer and suffer. And, and, and instead of trying to bring that to you, knowing that you recognize it and that I'm doing a good job makes that struggle within a whole lot less because it's not going unnoticed. Nobody wants to suffer in silence. Sometimes we just want to get it out. And if you go, hey, I know you're having a really fucking hard time right now, but I love you and I appreciate everything you're doing and I'm proud of you. That 90 pound weight on my shoulders now feels like 45. It's, it's half. I can, I let some out of the bottle. I got a whole lot more I can stuff down in there now while I'm continuing to go about doing what I'm doing. <clears throat> that recognition goes a long way for a lot of people. And a lot of people don't get it. That's why when people listen to the podcast and start showing that appreciation to their husbands, when the wives go, hey, I appreciate you going to work today. Mm -hmm. Here, here's a kiss and a coffee on your way out the door. That man goes to work on cloud nine because his struggles are noticed. It's no different than when you're, you know, you're having a bad kid day and I'm like, you know, I, I see that you're struggling. Is there anything I can do? Like, you want me to help you? You're a good mom. Like that shit matters. Mm -hmm. It fucking matters to you guys. That recognition is something that everyone craves, even if we won't admit it. Right. Any final thoughts on that email? That was a whole lot for a one page email. Yeah. What are we at time wise? Hour and 30 minutes. And then after I cut it down, probably hour 20. You want to get into that email you had set aside? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully it'll trigger the same thoughts that I had when I saw it while driving. All right. This one is titled Understanding My Connections. First, you guys are my favorite podcast about relationships. I am a queer woman and was raised with a similar mindset on relationships and the respect that you guys create together is unmatched. I recently left a relationship due to a lot of reasons, but mostly I found myself constantly showing up for them without the same energy given back. I do not mind where people are at in life. Pause. This is so this is the same email as the first one. Read. Can you go back like two sentences? I found myself constantly showing up for them without the same energy given back. That's the first email. She's a stay-at-home wife and getting to live that life while he's killing himself at work. Mm -hmm. He's showing up, and when he asks for the help, it's become a problem. Yeah. It's not getting that same energy back. How long do we have to kill ourselves to make things work before it's reciprocated? I'm not saying that the last email wasn't reciprocating because obviously she wrote in she's trying to find a solution right. that is helping, mm -hmm. but it has the same tone. Right. To me. Okay. Okay. I do not mind where people are at in life and always want to jump in to help. However, I did not see the point of dating without a future spoken about after months. I agree. Date to marry. I agree. Recently, this woman and I have been arguing about what went down after I found myself in a better relationship where energy and respect were met and also prioritized. So then why are you arguing with somebody else about what went down? Doesn't matter. It's your past. No, her and the woman that she was with. Like the falling out that happened. Was with. Right. And like she was arguing with her ex. Right. Why? Right. I was like, why? Why are you? Block that shit. People like to claim, oh, I don't know why they left me. I, I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, they know what they did. You know what you did. Deep down, they know what their problems are. It's every single reason that all the relationships fail. They know what it is. As somebody who figured out, like, I fully recognized the fallout of my actions, old me, dead me, did. Even then, in my victim mindset, in my trauma survival mindset, I knew I was fucking up. I knew that I was the problem, but admitting that hurt more than actually doing something about it at that time. Right. Change is hard. People don't want to do the work. Yeah. But everybody's, everybody's flawed. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody last night on TikTok say Jesus lived for 33 years and lived a perfect life. I can't go 33 seconds. We are all flawed people. All of us. Mm -hmm. So to throw the blame on somebody else for a, a failure of yeah. a couple, it takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. It's nobody's fault 100%. Even if it's 90-10, you still had 10% of the fucking problem. Right. I hate that shit. I hate it so much. <clears throat> I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear 
I don't ever want to hear, well, they did this. Who fucking cares what they did? Right. What, what did, did you, you do? do? Right, because you're the one that you're responsible for. You're not responsible for them. They have to live with that. Mm -hmm. You have to live with, with your reaction and to the decisions that you made. How do you sleep at night? You lay awake fucking regretting things or like replaying instances in your head or bitter and angry and sorrowful or living with fucking wish and want and what if. Those are all fucking consequences of your decisions. Your decisions. It's your life. No one's coming to fucking save you. Mm -hmm. I, I just... I hate that shit. I love that I'm getting back into reading again. The thing that I said where people who constantly blame everything in their life on somebody else, whether they intend to or not, are admitting that they don't have free will. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, Thank that's you. good. Yeah, you're you're basically admitting that you were a slave to something. Right. Well, everything. You you are a blade of seaweed in the ocean, and your only movement is caused by the motion of the ocean. Without the ocean, you are nothing. You are just a stagnant piece of something existing until it dries up in the sun. You want to take that metaphor a step further? Sure. You're a piece of driftwood that eventually someone signs, finds while you have been baking in the sun and mm -hmm. refashions you into something better. And, and now then, you have purpose. Right? Oh, so, I mean, unless it's somebody who finds you, repurposes you, and then discards you. And then you're just floating again until somebody else finds you. Well, there went my positive metaphor. Oh. <laughs> I was gonna say that you could, <coughs> I was gonna say that you can change and that there there could always be something better. Oh yeah, I mean definitely. <laughs> always. I or mean, you could just get discarded again, get fucked. <laughs> I mean, it all depends on your mindset though. Yeah. An absolutely terrible person could pick you up and transform you into something that is you in your mind disgusting and ugly, and you can still become something beautiful from that. Yeah. But it takes work. And perspective. Turn it back into a positive. <laughs> back into the email. We should make a shirt that says, in quotations, it's not my fault. Translation, I'm a slave. Or something along those lines. It's not my fault. Translation, I lack accountability. I don't know. I have to think about that. Yeah, we would have There's got to be a way that, to do yeah. that and make it like a good fuck you to people. So many people are going to get triggered by that shirt. Thought-provoking. They get triggered by us constantly. Right. Anyways, I don't give a shit about that anymore. <laughs> so it was my fault that he hit me? No, that's not what we're saying. <laughs> what we're saying is the choices in your life. You go out drinking one night. You get shit-faced black, blackout. Wake up three counties over. No idea where you're at. You, you made the choice to go out and get drinking right. until you had no cognitive function or awareness of what was happening. Anything that transpires after that, you made the decision to start drinking. You track it back far enough, you can always find a, a crossword where you could have made a different decision to have a different outcome. Right. That's just all there is to that. It doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. There can always be some sort of, of crossroad. Like I said, there's a fork. Right. You could have went left instead of right, and your outcomes would have been very different. The Back to the shirt idea. The thing that comes to my mind in reading that shirt is somebody who is stuck in the victim mentality who has repetitive, destructive behaviors within their life and they don't understand why nobody wants to be their friend or why nobody wants to hang out with them or why am I always upset? Why does nobody love me? Evaluate the decisions you're making. That's what I get from that shirt. Back Trying on. so hard to figure out that shirt phrase. Yeah, yeah. back to the email. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Recently, this woman and I have been arguing about what went down after I found myself in a better relationship where energy and respect were met and also prioritized. The previous person's attempts to argue with me to prove points and win me back in their life have been ignored and a boundary has been set that I do not wish to continue communicating as a respect for my new partner. Smart. It is very also, smart. Also, why does people think that they can win and argue you back into their life? How does that work? I think people who have that mentality of I will argue my point because I am right. And then when you see I'm right, you're just going to have to keep like give in hmm. because that's worth their whole life. It's worth their whole life. All I can think of is, is how horrible relationships can be. And then people fighting after the relationship and thinking that's somehow going to make things better. Yeah. These were the problems that we were having in the relationship and it's yeah. still fucking happening. And I'm not with you. Like I'm good. Right. Like, what the fuck do you want, dude? 
That would be my response to that person. If, yeah. Every time they text, what now? Are you looking to argue? Because if so, I don't have time. I'm busy. Right. Trying to pick a fight. Don't have time for that either. Mm-hmm. You're asking how the day is. It's fucking 59 degrees and, and sunny. Like, Google that shit. What do you need? What do you want from me? Why are you reaching out? Because every time you talk to me, it's conflict. Mm-hmm. I'm not willing to do that. Hit them with, I just don't have time for this. Yeah. Yeah. Don't have time for you. Mm. That's how I would word that. Not this. You. Because you are the problem in that situation. Yeah. Every time you reach out to me, it disrupts my fucking life. I would just, they, hypothetical situation that just popped up in my mind. One of my exes reaching out to me and it's just a slew of nasty text messages. And then my only response is, this is why we broke up. And then block. And that just led me to one of my greatest things I've ever said to somebody who tried to get back together with me. Yeah. Yeah. They hit me with, I miss you. And I was like, yeah, I'd miss me too. <laughs> Neat. <laughs> <laughs> Super duper. Back into the email, this person stated that I am an asshole for that due to our previous relationship and labeled this attempt at reconciling as wanting to understand what happened. She then, hang on, this person stated that I am an asshole for that due to our previous relationship and labeled this attempt at reconciling as wanting to understand what happened. So I think think that she was saying that they were trying to reconcile and the other person was saying that they were trying to explain, understand what happened. No, the time to understand what happened was before the breakup. Right. That's when you need to figure out things and understand what is happening. Right. Once the breakup happens, I don't think anybody's owed anything, especially if conversations that happened prior of this is the problem. This is why I'm not happy. And if this doesn't change, I'm gone. She stated that I am an asshole. Do you all believe that I was in the right for protecting my new relationship, even though it hasn't been that long? I don't think that you should have been engaging in conflict with your ex. Yeah, I think that. That disengagement should have happened. Immediately. Yeah. Like, I I can understand if you guys are broken up for like a week or two weeks and you guys are having like the the argument still because that person still means something to you and like you're trying to find your footing. But in that scenario, if you've moved on and this person is trying to create waves in your life right now, it's not just disrupting your life. It's Mm -hmm. disrupting the life of your person and and like the foundation that you're building. I I don't, I I don't know. I can understand if you guys were married and like had a, a huge history And like trying to work through things to get closure or maybe there's still a necessary connection if there's kids involved or alimony and there's court, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's a different scenario than somebody who was dating for six months and broke up. Right. We didn't work. What do you want? Yeah. You miss me? Because you're going about it the wrong way. Like Really at six months, that's a trial. Trial period. Yeah. Like. Free one year trial. Yes. (laughs) I will test drive this for a year. (laughs) I just, I'm I'm having a lot happening in my brain right now. I need to follow this train. Give me one moment, please. Okay. So at six months, hopefully at six months, moving in has not happened yet. Right? Okay. They're still living their lives. You're getting to know each other. People are busy right now. I'm expecting people to have maybe two dates a month. To be able to actually get together, spend quality time with one another and get to learn each other's soul. So at six months, I'm imagining eight dates, seven or eight dates. That I don't think that's enough to be able to be like, okay, we're moving in together now at this point. We're gonna we're gonna do the life shit. So if that hasn't happened at six months and you're just casually seeing one another at a breakup, that's just look, we're not meshing well. There should not even be an argument after that fact. It's, bro, I barely know you. Who do you think you are to talk to me like this? Okay, I'm going to pause you because your cognitive bias is showing. Is it? You have become an entrepreneur because of the podcast. Okay. You You are branching into body, apothecary. You've got your plant thing. You've got your own episode of the garden. You've got your Bible. You've got all these things that you're doing that takes up your time. Right. And we schedule time to to spend with each other to have this dope fucking life that we have. Right. Okay. Most people don't have the schedules that we have. Well, even when I was a working single mom, you still make time when you find that person and you're drawn to them. I I think that if you've been with somebody for six months and there's only been eight to 10 dates, I don't, I don't think this is like a real, a real want. If if you told me in the first six months of us courting Mm -hmm. that I'd only get to see you like eight times over six months, mm -mm. 
Oh, well, of course it would. I'm talking like long term, like six hours being spent. In okay, a day. okay, so that's different. Okay, yeah, that I, I thought I was clear on that. No, you okay. just you just said like spend quality time. I can get quality time I mean. from you in an hour, but okay. okay, so you're you're specifying six hours, like yeah, like, like a spend full, a day together, right? Okay, like full, that's very different. I yeah. agree. Okay, <laughs> like sleepovers could be happening. Right, I agree. That kind of thing. <clears throat> okay. Even at six months, I'm not moving in with anybody. Yeah, I'm not trying to have arguments and shit either. And then my mind went to, so at six months, if people are breaking up, what are they owed, right? Because people aren't owed anything in the world, right? You don't, you're not deserving of anything. You work for the things you have in life. You work for your growth. You work for your mental, your mentality, your perspectives and all of that kind of shit. I think as a decent human being, you should tell somebody why you're not wanting to be with them. So they can they can improve themselves. Right. Even if they right. get super shitty about it and they get super defensive and they try to start blaming you, be like, look, I'm not trying to argue with you. We are over and this is why I don't want to be with you anymore. Right. I think without that, what we have in society is just going to continue fucking... It's going to continue anyways. It, it will continue. Yeah. You're right, though, on all of that. You're right on that. Also, in that you don't owe any, you don't owe anyone anything. Right. Even if you were married for 25 years and the marriage is over, it's over. But I think at 25 years, you know what the problem is. Well, yeah, you knew what the problem was, what was happening. Right. I just, I don't know. I I think that people are they're too apt to disrupt their peace because somebody else, and you can even say this falls on compassion, mm-hmm. because if somebody that you want to really truly cared about is struggling and you think they need help and you try to help them it's going to disrupt your life Mm -hmm. and that you know so does that speak to compassion because at what point do you have to go hold up i recognize that the floor is lava and i'm not stepping on the floor and you are bringing a whole lot more into the house and like shit's starting to get further and further away i'm having a whole lot harder of a time making it to the next piece of furniture because of all the shit that you're bringing around me yes i watch that show a lot but I love that it started because in Tennessee, our son was like, can we watch The Floor is Love? And you're like, what is that, a movie? <laughs> um, it's a really dope TV show, kind of like Ninja Warrior. It reminds but- me of Double Dare from the 80s. But yeah, but it's one of those things that like, if, if you're having that kind of drama brought into your life by somebody else and you've moved on with your life, you're allowing that, that stress. You're allowing that drama because in reality, you could not answer the phone. Or you can not respond to that message. Or you can simply reply, I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. And then stop replying. I don't care if they call you 52 times in three hours. Don't answer the phone. Put your phone on Do Not Disturb and just let it go to the voicemail. Unplug. Mm -hmm. You don't owe anybody that. No. I also, last time I'm going to touch on this, the whole, (laughs) the eight, ten dates and six months or whatever, a lot of women have children now. Yeah. A lot of single moms. So I can't imagine no, single moms, a lot of them out there have two, three, four kids. So finding that off time to be able to dedicate long expended period of time to getting to actually know somebody could be hard. I really don't like the current state of affairs of things. Me either. Everybody's hurting because of it. Children, women, men, the family unit as a whole. Everybody is going through trauma right now. Being a single mom is not fun. Being a single dad's not fun. Being the dad whose wife and children left is not fun. Being the mom who has failed her kids so much that they are now in the system or they are with their father and being abused. It's a lot. And I mean that specifically, I've been watching a lot of intervention to preface that. So I've seen a lot of moms do some make really poor choices with their children. Right. Well, it's not just on TV though. Right. Like, I know, but we, we all, we've all made poor decisions. Yeah. Right. And that comes from a lack of guidance. It comes from thinking we know more than we do mm-hmm. growing up way too fast. Like there's a yeah. whole lot that goes into all of that. But when I heard you say that there are women out there who have two, three, four kids that are in the dating game and trying to find a good man and doesn't have time for it, they're not going to find one. Right. You know how hard it's going to be for a woman with four kids, especially if she's got four different dads to like be involved in that because it, that's a whole lot of drama that most men aren't going to want to deal with. Mm-hmm. I can do it on my own. And this is why men are leaving the dating game. And Oh, excuse me for the women who want to say that that shouldn't be an issue. It is. It is a fucking issue. It is because the children aren't the issue. It's not that 
It could be that there's four different dads. The problem is the drama that comes with it. You, you are somebody who is in the thick right. of high school petty ass back and forth drama because I have never heard of a good situation right. like that. It's always stressful. There's always something going on. Somebody's pissed off at somebody. Always conflict. There's always yeah. conflict. I think like, it boils down to lack of parenting. Yeah. I, I don't know. Every time I've talked about people who have ha had high body counts or we've had that discussion, people always turn it to mental health. So if it's mental health and they've got four different dads and four kids, right? They're not stable. So for a good man, the kids are a part of the problem. The exes are a part of the problem because there's going to be drama there. There's going to be court right. cases. There's going to be having to step in and not being able to discipline or like live the life. So now they're living third party view their house is taken over right they're not living with a, a person like if i was not able to be a parent to the kids and they were a factor in me being with you and i'm a third party bystander to that i'm not living my life i am a bystander to you living your life while i'm providing and trying to hope for good moments mm -hmm. why would a man want that like if, if we didn't have the understanding that we had moving forward with the kids i we wouldn't have gotten married it would have been a, a, a pleasant thing until it wasn't anymore and until I found something that I wanted to settle down with and that would be how that would have went. I I didn't want kids. I was very adamant about that. Like we talked about that when we were still just friends. It worked out. Like our life is dope as fuck. There are still times where the kids are a lot for me. Mm -hmm. And like I want to move to Tennessee. I want to move to Tennessee now. We can't do that because there's another parent and, and like family involved and there's school involved and there's a whole lot of things that go into that. And if we were together, we are together, and you didn't want to move to Tennessee because of all these other things and the kids and all of that, and that was my retirement dream, I now have a decision to make to give up my wife and, and the kids that I'm, I'm trying to help raise or my retirement dream that I've had my entire life because I have to make a sacrifice. And if I'm making a sacrifice and I'm still that innocent bystander, those aren't your kids. You don't get to talk to them like that. You don't get to discipline them. They're going to their other dads and their other dads and their other dads for the weekend. And we might possibly have one weekend alone in, in April of 2027. Why the fuck am I living like this? Right. That's how men see all of that. And when they meet <clears throat> women who have multiple kids or in some cases even one and their kids are grown or established or whatever the case may be, where they just don't want to fucking be a father, it, it turns out that that woman will never be anything more than a piece of ass and somebody to fuck around with until they find somebody that meets the standards mm -hmm. or the requirements they want. And in the event that they do become that innocent bystander and they happen to be involved in the family's life like that, and I'm only bringing this up again because I'm recently seeing it with somebody I love, those kids get ripped away and they are nothing to them anymore. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be a lot of women who are butthurt by everything he just said. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely terrified when I decided to leave my first marriage that I was going to be I was going to be alone for the rest of my life because of everything that you just said. I was fully aware that men did not want to deal with my ass and the kids and the drama that comes with all of that shit. There are times where I'm still shocked that you chose this life with me. Yeah, I'm happy, though. We have a dope life and we've got good kids and like they're the other half of the, the picture is doing a good job in terms of like parenting. Obviously there's things that we do that they probably don't like. And there's things that they do that I know I don't like, but that's doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we, if we were hundred millionaires and I could buy 50 acres of land, I could put them on the other side of 50 acres and we can live on our 50 acres and the kids can ride dirt bikes back and forth between the houses. And that would be great because I would never have to see them. <clears throat> we wouldn't have to interact. The kids could just do their thing and that would be an ideal situation. Right. But right. that's not life. And our, our dreams and wants and goals are going to be hindered in life because of all of this. And it's something that we've talked about at length and we are going to have to find ways to navigate life to get to the, the goals that we both have because we do want to do these things. Does that mean we have to wait 15 to 20 years because of a normal man that's not married to somebody is like, well, you know, your kids will be 18 and 12 years. So I have to just suffer for 12 years. Do you really want to sit more than a decade hoping that everything is going to pan out the way that you want it to pan out while you're in love still 
because you haven't hit the roommate phase yet and fucking life has, has not fucked you between this relationship. They haven't trained you how to talk to them. There's not like, I'm the problem all the time. I'll just go fuck myself. Like, there's just a whole lot of things that could go wrong in that 12 year span and men see that they don't want to, they don't want to commit to that. I don't know. I, I think that, um, I think that a lot of that also comes down to understanding and having expectations laid out ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Because when you lay the expectations of your life out ahead and you have the courting phase moving into a dating phase where you're talking about life goals and the things that you want and you see that the person that you're with has ambition and your, uh, your futures align and nobody's making sacrifices to give to the other person, like you're not meant to be with everyone. It's why relationships don't work. Not everybody are cut from the same cloth. It's just not going to work that way. So when you find somebody that has all those other things and, and there are extenuating circumstances that you have no control over, you have to weigh the options and go, okay, is this really worth it for me? And I think that a lot of men in the dating world have to do that shit. And women have to do the same thing because are you going to really have some fucking strange person around your kid or your kids? Are you going to be bringing people into your home over and over and over again? What happens if you're with someone for five years and it doesn't work and you move on to the next person and three years later, that doesn't work and you move on to the next person and a year later and in five years and six years and... You end up being a fucking old lady who's got a 40-year-old man neck beard living in your basement because your kids never had any real structure. Realize that, you know, mom's always going to take care of them and the men that come through her life is going to help donate to the cause. They see themselves as the man of the house. It's just a whole lot. It's a whole lot to process. I've been thinking about this shit a lot because of, of the things that I've seen recently. I'm lucky. Why do you say that? Because... Our, our struggles and all of that are minuscule. They really are. Like it's, um, there's not a lot of drama. There was a mm -hmm. little bit at one point, but that's, that's kind of just done away. Um, we still have conversations about things that really piss me off where I have to be like, well, this isn't really our, our situation. I, I can't, it is what it is. And I hate to say that, and I hate that that's even a thing, but sometimes things are out of your control. And I, I'm not going to blame other people. This is just the way th life is going right now, and I have to adapt to the situation to make it work it, for a best possible case scenario. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. know. I just think that things could be a whole lot worse than they are. We have a very good structure, and like we work really well as a team, and the kids see that, and like... Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that our our parenting and our relationship is is helping others grow and, and seeing that we're doing things is helping people co-parent. And like we, I don't know, I'm, I just view this as a lucky situation. I got everything I wanted in a woman. Um, And even though like I would have loved for you to not have kids so that we could travel the world and do all the dope shit that we want to do, like I'm enjoying being around the kids most of the time. You know, it's cool to watch them develop little personalities and like, start to understand things differently. And mm -hmm. um, they're my redemption kids because I, I was not a good parent. I, I did a lot of wrong. And like, I'm not super close to my kids. And even though I've tried it, mm -hmm. that relationship should have been built over decades right. and trying to build it now while they're adults with their own mindset and like differencing of opinions and shit. Like just because your DNA with somebody doesn't mean you love them. It means you share DNA. Right. And you have to, that mm -hmm. love is, is built through, more than just giving birth like mm -hmm. it's different for you guys because you actually grow a you know an alien inside of you parasite i hated being pregnant <laughs> a foreign entity in your body there were times <clears> that <throat> one of the kids would kick in my stomach and i'd get into a full-blown panic attack yeah yeah because there's a living being inside of me what the fuck right. <laughs> and we don't have that and though we do love and protect our kids and we we have that that desire to do so it's not the same thing. And you can, your kids can grow up and you can grow up to not like who they are as a, as a person mm -hmm. and they can grow up to not like you. Like, and, and that's okay to say that you don't, yep. you guys who would be like, Oh, you got to love your kids no matter what. No, you really fucking don't. If your kid grows up to be an asshole, your kid's an asshole. You can look out for them the best that you can. Mm -hmm. But once they become adults, they're adults. You've sent them off into the world. And if you, if, if they're, you know, if their uh, personalities are not indicative of yours, that's a you problem. You did that. You can't be mad about it. Yeah. Just because you don't have a relationship with your kids, you should have fucking built that foundation. I should have. I did I did the best I could 
But did I really? Because I'm sure I could have done a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. At the time, it's just not where my priorities were. I, I, I prioritized other things. It is what it is. It wasn't worth the arguments. It wasn't worth all the shit that I went through. And now trying to reestablish that is a problem. And in the same breath, me trying to reestablish re a relationship with my biological father. I've reached out and we've had a couple phone conversations. It's just not there. I don't have a, a bond with this man. I don't know him. And I'm sure he was a dope motherfucker most of his life. And he's got crazy stories that I would love to hear. Mm -hmm. I don't know him like that. So like reaching out to him every day to try to have a phone call about how his life is going. I, I don't, I don't small talk. I don't care. Yeah. Like, and it's a shitty thing to say, but it's, it's factual. I don't ever just reach out to people and be like, how's life going? Unless they're really close to me and I've got a good bond with them. Like I sent Jordan a text at six o'clock this morning. Like, how's your ankle? Like I care about Jordan, mm -hmm. but we have a bond and a relationship. And like, I genuinely want to see him do well. And that doesn't mean that I don't want to see my, my biological or my family members do well because I would love to see everybody succeeding. I just don't put any weight behind it. Like it's, I'm not attached to that. I don't know how to explain that. Like there's not a, there's no skin in the game for me. Yeah. So. Yeah. The only people I talk to from my family on a regular basis are my sister and my aunt. Yep. You know, I, for everybody else, I have a basic love for all of humanity. Right. Outside of that, I can still say fuck you. Yeah. I was thinking about this the other day because while we were at Thanksgiving dinner, my sister mentioned how like she'll go days before she hears back from me. Same with me. And it's not because I don't want to have the conversation, but like if you're sending me pictures of your chickens, I, I have shit to do. I don't give a fuck about that. And it's not that I don't love you and I'm glad that you're happy with your chickens. Mm -hmm. And if I was doing absolutely nothing but watching TV on the couch, I would totally talk to you about your chickens. Problem is, is I'm not doing that. I'm probably driving. I'm recording. I'm dealing with managers. I'm dealing with fucking processors. Like mm -hmm. I've got so much shit going on that that small talk doesn't matter. So much so that our poker table guy fucking emailed the company that is doing our custom felt because we're in a, a three way email thing. And they've asked me a question twice. And finally, he was like, this is the busiest client I've ever had in, in my existence. Just send what he wanted, and if it's wrong, I will pay for the other one, and we'll worry about it. And he completely removed me from the process because he's got a deadline. Right. I don't have time for small talk. Mm -hmm. I told you guys what I wanted. Figure that shit out. I'll pay you. We'll be done with it. Right. <clears throat> so it, it comes down to time and effort. If, I, if I'm on the toilet and I've got 20 minutes to kill, I'll have a conversation about your chickens or your dogs or watch a funny video. If it's your kids, different conversation. I may make time for that, mm -hmm. you know? If she was like, my oldest is blah, blah, blah. I'd be like, oh, really? You know, and I would engage in that because there's a life involved that like matters to me because he's a great kid. Right. But if she was to send me a message and was like, oh, so-and-so did such and such, you are not getting a reply. Mm -hmm. Don't care. Unless it was somebody that, you know, we care about. Yeah. I don't know. You got you to gotta prioritize things in your life and the things that matter are the things that get your attention, which is why I said earlier with the whole dating thing. If you're, if you're wanting something and you're trying to pursue it, you're going to spend a lot more than six dates or eight dates over 12 months, but you clarified your time months, frame. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I mean, if that's all on that email, we're that's two hours not. in. You want to wrap it up? I have well, to go. To, what? They're still. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay. I'm holding my bladder just so you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> also, I want to state that there is a trend within queer relationships that we adopt heteronormative values mm -hmm. and it's toxic. But I do genuinely believe that it has nothing to do with sexuality or gender roles, more so taking on the workloads that we are good at and nurturing the relationship, home life, and respect. I disagree that it's toxic. I, I also disagree. Um, I also don't think it's heteronormative values. I think it's just the values of a marriage. Right. Like, even I, I've watched a lot of documentaries. And in the olden days, I'm talking like, coal miner, medieval, there were people who were um, cross-dressing. So women would dress up as men and live the life of a man, go to work in the coal mines and come home to their wife. Like, of course, all this shit was under wraps. Right. Like, nobody knew about it. They all knew this person as a man. They lived that life, though. They had those roles. They had, I would go out and work. You're going to stay here and take care of the house, and we're going to be in a relationship together. I think, yeah, I think that's just the roles of being in a relationship. Yeah. We don't have to tie it to any sexuality. Masculine and feminine energies. Yeah, you're going to have that, though. And, you, and that's 
you see that more prevalent in the gay community than in, in the straight one. Right. Because people live those, those those identities. They make that their identity. So those energies are very prevalent there. I think you guys are a great example of fair play in households and that didn't... I think you guys are a great example of fair play in households and the dynamic you have all created is something I hope to find one day. Well, we live that masculine feminine role that she just said was toxic. Yeah. That kind of contradicts itself. Contradicts. Contradicts. What did I say? Contradicts? Yeah. <laughs> ha! Ha! Lay your dick on a counter. Wanted to know your thoughts on that, I guess, as well. Thank you all for being a walking example of what love should look like. I think that ties back into what the expectations that we laid out from each other and what we were willing to do mm -hmm. to make the relationship work. That comes from conversations and not just rushing into shit and not just sleeping with somebody and going, okay, we're together now. Like right. there was a lot of foundation built and a lot of conversations had of what was and wasn't willing to be a thing. And in the beginning, like my, my boundaries were like, fucking clear these are the things that i will and will not accept and i'm not willing to budge on them because i was coming out of a marriage like you had a bad relationship you had your standards i'm not going to budge on these things these are things that i'm not okay with and if i'm not okay with those things then we're not going to be together like that's not controlling and i don't give a fuck how people are going to tell you that as a man if you're not okay with these things you're insecure or whatever that bullshit is, it, it's okay to have your boundaries and things it's that you're okay not willing to, to accept. Right. If you if you know something's going to make you unhappy and somebody that you're trying to be with is not willing to to budge on that, mm -hmm. don't get into a relationship with them because you're gonna fucking be unhappy. You know that going into it. Yeah. It doesn't make you controlling. It means that you have an expectation of a partner, and not everyone is meant to be your fucking partner. Mm -hmm. I got nothing else. We're going to do uh, at least one side R&R &R this month. We have a few interviews lined up and um, we have content coming. So December is going to be kind of a weird flow. Content releases will be the same, but like how we release and what we release is going to be evolving a little bit. Um, but 2024 is going to be a dope thing. And I'm very excited for season two. And I'm looking forward to continuing to do this with you. Me too. Thank you guys for listening. And remember, you are the authors of your own life. So grab a pen. And we will see you on the next one. Bye, guys.